bonds have been hit hard this past year. And if you're not using bonds just right in your portfolio, you may be suffering losses that are avoidable. In today's episode, I'm gonna teach you how to use bonds the right way in your portfolio so you can get them for their maximum impact. Hey everyone, I'm James Canole, founder of Root Financial, and I'm here to teach you how to get the most out of life with your money. In today's video, we're gonna walk through how can you use bonds most effectively in your portfolio. They've been whacked in a big way this year. Does that mean we should avoid them? No, it means we need to understand them deeper so we can understand at what point do they make sense in a portfolio and at what point can they be potentially detrimental in a portfolio. To start though, let's take a big step back and ask, what is a bond? We know that if you own a stock, you own a company. Well, if you own a bond, do you own a company? No, it's different. If you own a bond, what you are doing is you are lending your money to a company or to a government. When you look at a company like AT&T, for example, they have the most debt of any US publicly traded company at the moment, something like $170 billion. So when you hear a company carrying debt, the way they carry that debt is through issuing bonds. Who owns that debt? You own that debt, I own that debt. People who invest in bond mutual funds and target date funds in any specific individual bond, you are carrying that company's debt. When you look at the US government, the US government currently has about $31 trillion of debt. Well, who owns that? Again, you do, I do, people around the world own that debt. When you invest in certain funds, when you invest in certain products, that debt is owned by individuals and other countries. So one company's liability or one government's liability, that is another individual's asset. Now, when you lend that money, you're not doing it out of the goodness of your heart. You are lending money because you expect to be paid interest on that for some period of time. And when that bond matures, you get paid your money back. So when you do lend that money, there is a certain degree of risk. Now there's multiple risks with bonds, but the two biggest are credit risk and interest risk. Let's explore each so we can start to understand how bonds might play a role in your portfolio. Well, the first one we'll talk about is credit risk. Credit risk is just what's the likelihood that the company or government you're lending money to will remain solvent and pay you back. If you're lending your money to a government that's gonna be around or to a company that's gonna be around, well, as long as they're making income and staying in business, they have an obligation to pay you back your money along with interest. Now, if you are lending your money to companies that are maybe in distress, so distressed companies with distressed debt, you're gonna get a higher interest rate because no one's just gonna lend money to that company without being compensated for that risk. But the risk is you might not get all of your interest back or all of your principal back. There's actually ratings agencies, there's Standard & Poor's, there's Moody's, and what they're doing is they're saying, what's the credit worthiness of the institution or government that you're lending your money to? You might see something with a AAA rating. That means based on their financials, based on the company's profitability, based upon their revenue, they have a very high likelihood of being able to service this debt. You might see a company rated C. Now, each of the ratings agencies has different ratings, but with Moody's, for example, C indicates a junk bond rating. It means you're likely not to get paid back your full principal or your full interest. There's a certain level of risk inherent with that. So when you're lending your money, one risk that you're looking at is credit risk. It's why companies with a higher rating or governments with a higher rating can pay less in interest because investors are more likely to give them money and not require as much in return for that loan. Whereas companies that don't have a great credit rating, well, why would I lend to them at the same interest rate I would lend to a company that has a wonderful credit rating? If this is much more secure, I'm only going to lend to a company with a lower credit rating if there's more interest to compensate me for that additional risk. So that's one of the risks of bonds. Well, what's another risk to owning bonds? It's interest rate risk. And this is really the risk that's driven a lot of downturn in the bond market this year. I mentioned the AT&T is the US company with the most amount of outstanding debt as of today. Well, what if I lent my money to AT&T a year ago? And let's just use, and these numbers aren't accurate, but I'm just making this up. What if they said, James, you know what? Lend us your money for five years. We'll pay you 2% interest for the next five years and then pay you all your money back. Wonderful, let's say I go ahead and do that. Well, interest rates rise. And now Verizon comes along. Verizon is another company that has a lot of debt outstanding. And they say, hey James, interest rates have gone up. We'll now pay you 4% on your money if you lend money to us. Well, what happens to my existing bond that I have to hold for five more years or maybe four more years at that point, but only pays 2% until maturity? Well, that bond becomes a lot less attractive. Who's gonna wanna go pay full price for that bond when they'll go get another bond paying 4% interest? oversimplifying how this works. If you're an actual bond expert or know this seems really kind of silly and ridiculous, 
but this is a general sense of how things work. So when you look at this, if I simply hold my AT&T bond until maturity, only get in 2% interest, well, I'll get all my money back at the end, assuming at and is still solvent and still in business. Same thing with Verizon. I'll still get all my money back at the end of the term or once it matures, but I'll get a higher rate along the way. However, if I wanted to sell my bond in the secondary market, these are instruments that can be bought and sold at any time. No one's going to pay full price for a bond paying 2% interest when market interest is now 4%. So in general, as interest rates go up, this is why bond prices fall, because existing bonds are a lot less attractive because they have lower interest rates. Well, the inverse is also true. As interest rates go down, bond prices go up. What if I now have that Verizon bond that's paying 4% interest, and next thing we know, interest rates go back down? Well, now all of a sudden, this looks a lot more attractive because I can no longer go and get 4% in the open market. By the way, this is one of the biggest reasons that bonds have performed very well over the past 40 years up until this year. It's because in the late 1980s, interest rates were double digits. So bond prices were paying double digit returns. Well, as interest rates started to fall, that was a huge headwind for bond prices. So if you owned a bond, not only were you getting the interest on that bond, but the price of those bonds was increasing because they were becoming more and more attractive as market rates fell and fell and fell. Well. The inverse is now true this year. Rates have gone up real quickly, which means bond prices have fallen real sharply. So why has that happened this year? What, what's the actual interest rate? Is AT&T or Verizon or the US government, are they just deciding, you know what, we wanna raise rates? No, it all starts with something called the Fed funds rate. The federal funds rate is the interest rate that big banks will charge other banks when they're lending their excess reserves. So it's not an interest rate that you have access to or I have access to or really anyone has access to. It's kind of an interbank interest rate. But when you hear Jerome Powell or when you hear the Fed talk about we need to raise rates, this is the rate they're talking about. Here's the thing though. The federal funds rate is almost like the rate on which other interest rates are all based upon. So if the Fed funds rate increases, well, that changes interest rates for auto loans. It changes interest rates for credit cards. It changes rates for mortgages. It changes rates for personal loans. So as that rate increases, all other interest rates are almost benchmarked to that. And so they get pushed upwards as well. And the Fed funds rate has risen dramatically this year. I'm recording this in October of 2020. Well, in January of 2020, the Fed funds rate was 0.08%. Today, it's actually a range, there's a limit on the low side and the high side, but it's 3% to 3.25%. And by the end of 2022, it's expected to be in the low to mid 4% range. So to go from 0.08% to about four and a quarter percent over the course of 12 months, that's a really dramatic increase. And that's trickled down into interest rates on bonds, on mortgages, on cars, on credit cards, on everything else. So go back to my example. I said when interest rates go up, bond prices go down. So does that mean bond prices as a whole have been hit the same exact way? Well, no, it depends on the type of bond that you own. If we look at the Barclays US one to three year treasury index, those bond prices through the 1st of October have gone down about four and a half percent this year for perspective. So those are short term bonds. One to three years mean you're holding a bond and yes, the price has gone down because you're accepting a lower interest, but you're only accepting that lower interest for anywhere between one to three years. So the bond price isn't hit as hard because once that matures, you can just reinvest at a higher rate. So the short-term bonds have gone down about 4.5% through October 1st of 2022. Now compare that to the Barclays five to seven year index. Those rates or those bonds have gone down about 12.5% through October 1st of 2022. Why is that? Well, again, it has to do with time. In the short term rate, you're only holding onto a bond that's paying a lower interest rate for one to three years. So you're not gonna have as hard of a hit on that bond because again, once that bond matures, you can reinvest it at a higher rate. Well, with intermediate term bonds, say five to seven years in this example, you have to hold that bond for a lot longer before you can actually sell it. So because of that, the price you can get for that bond is going to be depressed even more because you still have some time until that matures and can be reinvested at a higher rate. And then finally, if we look at the Barclays US Treasury 20 plus year bonds, those have been hit really hard. They're down over 30% through October 1st of this year. For perspective, at the same time, the S&P 500 was down about 24%. 
So when you look at this, a long-term bond, as interest rates have gone up and you're holding this 20 plus year bond where you're accepting really low interest now for 20 plus years, of course that's gonna get hit much harder. So as you look at interest rates rising, the longer the duration of your bond, the longer until your bond matures, the more of a hit you're gonna take this year. Now the trade-off for that is over a longer period of times, long-term bonds are going to perform better. If we go back to the 1920s, one month treasury bills, they've returned about 3.3% per year. Now, when you keep in mind that inflation's run about 3% over that time period, it's a very, very, very small real return, but that's the return you get for an ultra short-term bond. Now, if you compare that to long-term government bonds, they've returned about 5.6% over that same time period. So same thing here, as we're saying, you're getting compensated for taking that risk, you're getting a higher return, but the risk is those bonds have been hit really hard this year. So what do we do with all this information? So do you sell your bonds now and say, geez, if interest rates keep rising, well, we're gonna keep struggling. Or geez, if that's the risk of bonds, maybe I should have more in stocks or maybe other assets or maybe protect it more. Well, let's walk through what you can practically do as an investor with this. Number one, keep in mind that bonds aren't the place you should take your risk. I've seen far too many people over the last number of years, they've really extended on the maturities that they're owning with their bonds. They've said, okay, well, we'll buy the bonds that are 20 years or 30 year bonds because they're paying a little bit more in yield. Well, those people are paying the price right now. Those bonds have been hit even harder than many parts of the stock market have been hit. So my philosophy is if you're gonna take risk, wonderful, but take risk in the stock market. And by risk, all I mean is diversify your portfolio in a way where yes, you're gonna accept those ups and downs, but you're gonna have a much stronger long-term return to show for that. The bond portion of your portfolio should be the part that represents stability, maybe a little bit of income, but it's not where we should be taking our risk. Number two, the second thing you can do is diversify your bond portfolio. So any investment that we own, you should have a good reason for owning it. You don't just put your money into something because it's an option in your 401k plan or because some advisor recommended it. You should be able to say, why exactly do I own that fund? Well, if we look at bonds in my philosophy, bonds should almost be like the emergency fund for your portfolio when you're retired. So if we have a year like 2022 and the market's dropping, well, let's pull our money from the bond portion of our portfolio. What we saw though is not all bonds are created equal. If it's a short-term bond, that's performed way differently than a long-term bond. So let's say you need a bond portfolio to meet your first several needs of retirement. Well, do we have part of that portfolio in bonds that are very, very, very short term? Less in interest, but a whole lot less volatility that we're gonna accept for that position. We need it to be there and get the little interest that it can. Then do we have a portion of the portfolio and maybe one to three year bonds? What that does is there's gonna be a little bit more fluctuation but we have time until we need that portion of our portfolio. And then finally, do we have a section of our portfolio that's maybe more intermediate term bonds? Meaning we'll get more interest, we'll get more long-term growth. And by having a layer of short-term and even ultra short-term bonds, it gives us the ability to wait until we actually need to touch those funds, meaning we have time for the interest to accrue and for the growth to play out, even if we accept a little bit more ups and downs in the short term. So even within the bond portion of your portfolio, make sure there's layers, make sure you're diversified there in a way that's gonna allow you to achieve your goals. And then number three, understand that rates rising, although very painful in the short term, is actually to a long-term bond investor's favor. Yes, it hurts. Yes, bond values have gone down quite sharply, even in the relatively short period of time so far this year. What that's gonna do is it's gonna be like taking a big step back, but you're now taking larger steps forward. And once you cross that break even point, which is fully based upon the duration of your bond portfolio, well, any future growth is all gravy and it's all more than you otherwise would have returned. So while it's been really painful in the short term, what this has actually done is if you have a 20, 30 plus year retirement, and if bonds are gonna play any role in that, this has actually set you up to create more income and have more growth over the course of that time because of what interest rates are doing. So as we look at this, it's helpful to understand what is a bond? How do bonds work? What are the risk of bonds? And how do we view bonds in light of our overall portfolio? If you want more information about how much should I have in bonds or how little should I have in bonds, well, check out some of these videos above because what this is gonna show you is how do bonds fit in your overall retirement portfolio as opposed to looking at them in a vacuum. Once again, I'm James Canal, founder of Root Financial. And if you're interested in seeing how we help our clients at Root Financial get the most out of life with their money, be sure to visit us at www.rootfinancialpartners.com.